Welcome to United States Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. U.S. Farm Report presents why the farmers need to support the NFO grain program with today's special guest, Orrin Lee Staley, president of the National Farmers Organization, and Herb Goodman, National Grain Commodity Director. Here is Mr. Staley. This afternoon, we're visiting with Herb Goodman, director of the NFO Grain Commodity Department. This is a time of year that farmers are either thinking about harvesting or are beginning to harvest their grain crops. And it's also the time of year that they're making their decisions as to what they're going to do with that grain crop they're harvesting. Many of the bargaining efforts that NFO has been uh, using uh, and providing as efforts for farmers to raise their price levels are not generally understood. Farmers understanding these programs, we're sure, will almost 100% of them support the NFO's collective bargaining efforts. But in understanding the programs that NFO is using in bargaining, first you must understand the scope of the organization that we are organized in 25 states. You must understand that bargaining must be done nationwide, that it must be done over a large enough area so that you can affect the supply that goes to plants throughout the area. And of course, many of the companies that we're dealing with are large enough to cover the entire area whether it means grain, whether it means meat, or whether it means dairy. But today we're going to talk about the NFO collective bargaining program as it's operating on grain. And how we're advising our members to follow certain definite steps. And certainly we cannot take these steps for farmers that are not members of the NFO because of the legal uh, ramifications that you would have if you were not dealing just for members. And so for this reason, we're wanting to explain our program so that more farmers can understand our program so that all farmers can become a part of this effort by joining the NFO and using their production to bargain with. At this, uh, this time, I would like to introduce uh, to the audience uh, Herb Goodman, director of the NFO Grain Commodity Department. Herb, uh, you've had uh, a lot of experience in the last few months. Uh, you've had the experience of the widely publicized uh, NFO coordinated grain sales program on that historic day of February the 23rd. Uh, you've had a lot of experience in the past few months dealing with some of the largest grain buyers throughout the country. And I know that sometimes when I walk into your office and maybe stay for only 15 minutes, I'll hear you talking to a processor maybe in Ohio or a grain dealer in Ohio. A few minutes later, you may be talking to somebody as far away as Idaho or somebody in Minnesota or somebody in Missouri uh, as you talk on behalf of the members. So let's get into the real specifics of the grain program that you're directing. Uh, what are the first steps that the farmers have to take in order to be successful in bargaining for grain? Well, of course, the first step that uh, any farmer has to take is to at harvest is to maintain control of his grain. He can only do this by, as we say, store and hold at harvest time. When we, as we have checked back through the records, historically, the lowest selling price uh, is what the farmer receives uh, at harvest time. Uh, occasionally, there will be uh, a change to the pattern, but uh, I would say offhand, Ornley, it would, uh, it would run nine years out of ten on any particular grain that they will receive the lowest price if they sell right out of the field. Now, this is a first step, but uh, that's, only, that's only part of the story, Ornley. This is right, Herb, and I know that we all recognize this, and I know farmers recognize it, Herb, if they just stop to think about what's happened over the years. Right. But I know this year that the members that followed the NFO Collective Bargaining Grain Program, uh, many of them sold their soybeans through the in-position grain sales at anywhere from 
uh, 20 cents, or I don't believe any of them even went that low. No, I believe it was more, a, than. Uh, more than that, what, uh, 40 well, cents? Well, they would run in there in the vicinity of 40 cents, 35 to 40 cents over uh, the price at harvest. And up to a dollar, dollar and a quarter. Right. Uh, corn, uh, they sold their corn. Uh, uh, those that followed the NFO in position grain sales program uh, sold their corn anywhere, what, from 10 to 20, 25, right. 30 cents a bushel. Right. But the farmer that sold at harvest time, uh, this didn't do him any good. Not a bit. Uh, he lost, uh, lost this opportunity. Uh, so um, if they store and hold, and this is the first thing that they have to do, because if they sell it, uh, then... Uh, they have no bargaining power. They've lost their bargaining right. power. Uh, what, what then is the next thing they have to do? The first thing they have to do then is to store, uh, hold their grain. Uh, but what is the next step that they have to do? Well, the next step, the farmer or the NFO member has a choice uh, or has a chance now to take the second step. Prior to the program brought out by the NFO, the farmer could only take this first step, which was to store and hold, and then he was at the mercy of dealing with large companies, corporations, processors, as an individual. Now, the second step, and fully as important as the first, is that he should sign his grain uh, into the NFO grain program on what we call a grain sales agreement. Now, this grain sales agreement does not change the ownership of the grain. The member still retains full ownership at all time until this grain is sold. He merely authorizes the NFO to bargain for and to sell his grain. I might say that the farmer, the member has a choice as to which of the selling periods that he wishes to sign his grain up for sale. He also has a choice of how much he wishes to place in position. This grain can be in position either on the farm or in the elevator. We have tried to change uh, uh, these circumstances just as little as possible for the convenience of the member. Well, Herb, this uh, is of great significance as far as the farmer's concerned, as far as the NFO member's concerned, because this gives him an opportunity to pick uh, what period within about two month period uh, of time within the year that he needs income. And of course, uh, it's of vital importance that uh, also the members realize that if they all store and hold their grain, that really what would happen if they still continue to try to do this just as individuals, that they would raise the price rail level uh, temporarily. Possibly. Uh, many people have not understood that this is not uh, the NFO's efforts to raise the prices temporarily, but to stabilize right. prices, uh, to get contracts that will give us stability, but also to ma maintain a general price level that is advantageous to farmers which will in the end reflect, uh, with farmer support, uh, a fair price equity of income. Now then, if the farmers, Herb, uh, would sell uh, as individuals after they've stored and after they've held, uh, I think, as you've said many times, that there's no question of what would happen. You'd have a great fluctuation in prices. And what had happened, the grain trade is in the past, uh, would raise the price temporarily. They'd drop the price about two or three days in a row. Then the individual farmers would run over each other to sell. Right. This would drop the price down considerably, and there would be no way to maintain a general price level and then increase this general price level as right. the year progressed. Now, I think that the thing that so many people do not understand is that if you sell this grain or meat or any bargaining effort that hinges around, and it must hinge around, a volume, right. uh, that if you sell this into a new marketing pattern, that this brings new competition into the market. And this is what brings the general price level up. And if you have the grain in in-position sales, where the farmer has picked the period of time that he wants the grain sold, but so that it can be moved uh, in volume, not just in one area of Iowa or one area of Illinois, but in 16 states uh, on the same day, if necessary, and crisscrossing it into patterns. Herb, would you explain 
uh, how this does affect the general price level, because I think we should discuss uh, some things that farmers have forgotten, that the predictions on the price of soybeans, uh, even a little before your February 23rd coordinated sales effort. But I think that if you would tell the people how your in-position grain sales upset marketing patterns of the past and how this affects the trade in general. Well, uh, I think that we have to realize to begin with that the marketing of practically all of the farm commodities, and grain is no exception, has fell into a set pattern back through the years, Ornley, and the various buyers processors, uh, commission houses, even down to the local elevators, have certain producers uh, that sell to them. Now, if I were to take my own neighborhood, for example, uh, in the, my own small town there, we have two elevators. Now, due to the differences in people's choice, some of them sell to one elevator and some of them sell to others. There are other farmers around there that maybe uh, haul their grain uh, 10 miles up to an elevator in a larger town. But over the years, this falls into more or less of a set pattern with minor change due to the day-to-day uh, -day bid of these various elevators. So over the long haul, these elevators can uh, determine in advance, and some of them very closely, how many bushels of a certain grain that they will take in through the year. Well, now we take on, go on up another step, and in many cases, an elevator will have a certain commission man or a uh, uh, broker, or in some cases, a grain company, but some buyer that he favors. And through uh, just mutual business dealings or other circumstances, he will fall into a habit of always selling to this same party. Well, you can see how that uh, some of these sources of grain become practically wired, Ornley, and once it reaches a point where you can almost depend on it, then many times your price competition uh, slackens or lessens uh, at least there's more of a tendency in that direction. Now, with our program, we are able to change this marketing pattern in many cases. This, just in one local area, would not affect the supply too much, but when you multiply it times the hundreds and thousands of uh, local elevators, different areas, then this change in supply pattern really commences to be significant. And whenever we achieve this point, in order to make up the supply that uh, this buyer or this grain company or processor did not get through these established channels, then he has to step out and bid up in order to replace that. Now, you might want to carry that a step further, Ornley. We've seen it in other commodities. Well, Herb, I think that what you're hitting on here is so vital that maybe we should discuss this a little further because this is getting into the real core of bargaining and people must understand what happens. Now, I think we want to be certain that the local elevator does not interpret that this program is bypassing him because no, he receives so many benefits. Right. First, in the normal in the past, and we're advocating our members to store their grain and to hold it. Now, in the past, what has happened was, and they can use on the farm storage, preferably if they have it, of course, but they don't have enough. So instead of the uh, grain moving right through the local elevator into a terminal warehouse, uh, maybe 300 miles from there, where it gets into the grain trade's hands, and I understand that a large grain company, if they're short on commitments, can buy for a cent a bushel many times uh, from another big uh, supposedly competing company. So for one cent a bushel, supply changes. But it cannot do that if it's out here in the farmer's hands, if he owns it, and if it's in the local elevator. Now, the local elevator then gets the storage. Uh, he's able many times to do many of the services that have to be performed. We can't go into business in right. the handling of the grain. So it, uh, the local elevators that have been working with our program are very happy with it uh, generally. Now I want to, I know that in one area, 
Uh, and again, I should say, not only can just an individual farmer changing his pattern, the local elevator can't change his pattern either. He's tied by, you know, as far as the selling is concerned. Uh, but he can get the advantage of the storage, uh, the advantages of the handling and such. Uh, that is where his profit has been anyway. Only he can get a better job uh, as far as storage done in, in using his facility. But then when you sell it overall, uh, what happens is, and I know that in one area of Iowa, one large company would not buy uh, from NFO. Uh, they refused to. Now, as I understand it, this grain they felt certain that they were going to get. Uh, they felt certain they were going to get these soybeans. They always had. But what happened was, you were able to sell them, they moved completely out of that area. Tens of thousands of bushels in one day's time just evaporated from that area. Now, Herb, what happens in that area when, uh, as far as that company's concerned, they have a processing plant for soybeans in that area. This is right. And the only way that they can replace this uh, uh, commodity that they lost on Lee, uh, or rather, I won't say the only way, but the usual way is to bid up on price in order to get a supply to substitute for the amount that they didn't get. When this happens, then we immediately see a more aggressive uh, uh, bidding as far as uh, the grains are concerned between one elevator and another, between one area and another. And uh, no member, no farmer individually, I don't believe, could attain uh, anything like this, Ornley, whereas as, as the organization, as a bargaining organization, and spread over the area that we are, we can't, we can't attain this. Well, it's this, been proven. This is right, Herb, and it's so important even one state couldn't attain this. Right, right. Uh, even if all the farmers belonged in one state. Let me say that also one uh, particular uh, corn or soybean growing association could not uh, uh, attain this to the effect we can because at a certain point there, then you would get into a substitution of corn oil for, sub, uh, for soybean oil or cottonseed oil for soybean oil. So I think this has to cover the whole spectrum of, of farm production only. Well, this, of course, is basic, uh, this, and this is the reason the NFO program is sound. Right. Uh, it's covering all commodities because if you don't bring them all up in relative balance, you, you're soon going right. to lose your effect in any one. But pursuing this a little farther, when this, uh, when this company lost these tens of thousands of bushels of soybeans out of all the counties right around his plant. And then what happened was, uh, undoubtedly, he had to go out into other areas. Right. Well, in some areas, this had happened to other processors. So when he went in there, they were already competing. And of course, they competed first more vigorously right within the area around their plant. But of course, if the production that was going to be sold at that given time was already gone, then they have to go into other areas. And so when they do that, they have to add more transportation costs, right. which will mean that they'll be, have to bid up to get them more in the other areas. And so then when they come back into this area, they will pay higher then shortly in this area than they did before in order to offset the transportation cost in. And so you start a spiral going. And I think uh, people have forgotten what uh, all, practically all the farm publications, and we take, uh, the farm publications, we take uh, the publications and analyze and predict uh, farm prices. And Herb, uh, before February the 23rd, and the reason I keep referring back to that, if people forgot, the large grain buyers had refused to buy uh, and before February the 23rd when you offered on behalf of NFO members this production. So we coordinated a sale that was sold uh, through large grain companies, uh, two large grain companies, uh, to local elevators, uh, just a mixture. And this coordinated sales that happened at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on February the 23rd uh, really shook the grain trade up, as we well know. Since then, uh, you've been able to deal with many of these companies that refused. And I know that you had pledges from them that if we got a certain volume together, that they would pay a premium. Uh, they wouldn't even offer the market price when you offered them twice the volume, they said, if you got the volume together. Uh, but since then, the situation has been different. Uh, what, was the, what were the predictions on the supply, the, the price of soybeans, for example, before that uh, sale? Because this, soybeans has been attracting a lot of attention. Well, I would say, check back just about a year ago. 
Uh, in fact, a year ago, clear back to uh, uh, planting time, and the farmer was told that he was producing, would be producing the largest soybean crop in history, and that because of this uh, tremendous crop, which uh, was estimated at something over 800 million bushels, that uh, he would undoubtedly uh, have to take uh, the equivalent of the loan price, or two dollars and a quarter national average, at harvest. And you know what? He did. Uh, in my own local area, the sale price was down to within uh, a cent either way of the government loan price. Now, after that time, the supply didn't change. After harvest, the supply didn't change. The demand or the usage, the utilization didn't change any more than uh, it would have on Lee. And yet, because many, many farmers took the first step, and they did store and hold. Then it set it up so that when we came along with our coordinated grain sale, this was the necessary second step to activate uh, this price rise that we saw develop last year. And many, many of these same people that had predicted uh, that the price wouldn't get essentially above loan rate and sell on slight bulges they had to eat their words only before the year was out, of course. Well, Herb, the trend uh, in exports, uh, you could almost project how many bushel were going to be exported by uh, January last year, February. Uh, you could predict the usage, uh, but what were they even predicting in February? I remember uh, some publications you pointed out to me recently they were telling farmers to sell at about a certain level. Do you recall uh, what they were telling them along? Yes, I remember after they got above two and a quarter that then they were telling them to sell at 250. And then they had to move on up to around 260. And uh, one in particular I remember said that, well, they uh, kind of goofed on the prediction as far as price was concerned on soybeans and that uh, they exceeded their expectations by quite a margin. Uh, before we get off uh, uh, of here, Orn Lee, I'd like to also touch on wheat because uh, wheat is becoming uh, in the limelight more and more these days. Right. And of course, many of our producers do raise wheat. And I, I hope that the farmers, the wheat farmers, and uh, our NFO members that produce wheat realize that the climate, the marketing climate on wheat has certainly changed. The uh, carryover, uh, of course, is, is down uh, uh, considerably over what it was a few years ago. And our members have to be aware of this uh, new condition that pertains to wheat. And this is why that it is so important at this point, because you did a real good job of storing and holding at harvest. Uh, the trade still speaks of the tight holding action by farmers on their wheat. Uh, I don't know where they got that name, but they refer to that. Now, this is just the first step. Follow through with the second step. Sign up your wheat in the NFO grain program uh, in one of the five, or now in one of the four remaining selling periods. This is a real important second step. Well, Herb, this is so vital that this step be understood. Yes. Uh, I think that it's so significant, and I look at dairy prices, and up to this point, uh, the dairy prices, even though the supply was down, uh, shortage, critical shortage in some areas, but the price only went up the amount of the government price support increase, except in the areas where we have been bargaining and doing an effective job, which we intend to keep building on, in which we are confident is going to roll the prices up as far as dairy is concerned. Now, I think it's so significant that people understand that what our bargaining efforts really do is to raise the general price level. Sure, in the volume sales, you're able to get a few cents a bushel more, usually, and not always, but most of the time, and they can get as one farmer. Uh, this adds to it. But the main thing is that by bargaining together and selling together, they raise the general price level. And these publications that have always been so accurate in the past, they didn't miss the amount of production. No. 
They didn't miss the amount of usage uh, very much, Herb. And they had the prices projected through the year. But once you upset this balance of buying, and you upset the patterns, then you change competition into a vacuum. And, and by a vacuum, when a supply moves out of an area, this creates a vacuum. Because it has always moved in about a certain pattern. Or if one elevator changed or one farmer, it didn't make any difference. Right. But when they change this and a large volume moves out and this vacuum exists, then they've got to really compete. Uh, Herb, I think we had a very interesting visit in the national office with an official of the European common market countries uh, who was talking primarily on grain. And of course, uh, he knows uh, the significance that we're having on the scenes and he came to Corning, Iowa. Uh, he was one of the top officials. Uh, what was your impression of that visit? Uh, uh, was it a significant visit? Yes, I thought it was. Uh, only, of course, he was very interested in the, uh, our membership agreement and uh, our bargaining efforts, how these efforts affect the price. Uh, one thing that was real refreshing was his uh, uh, ready admittance, acknowledgement uh, that you have to have good, substantial farm prices if you're going to have a good, healthy economy in that country. And uh, this is uh, certainly one thing they're trying to do there is to raise the price to the farmers in the, in the European community over there. Well, Herb, I think this is so significant that we... Uh, people understand that besides just bargaining, we're performing many other important functions. Because this right. is a man that's going to be negotiating with top governmental officials on the common market, uh, in, the, in the present round of discussion on tariffs, on trade, worldwide prices. I think it was significant that he was recognizing that our volume of production and the potential of the operation of our program were supply that went into export could be bargained for and sold together in volume again. There were maybe a treaty type of arrangement that could do something about worldwide prices. These are significant things that an organization is doing that, that individual farmers couldn't do. And I think that these points are so significant. Uh, Herb, I would just like to recap here, uh, I think, and try to get it uh, into everybody's mind, the points that you have been stressing. First, they must store and hold, or they never establish any bargaining power. This is significant. The next thing they must do, and they must go beyond that, and when you talked about the wheat, uh, we had a, a large elevator company uh, president in our office that said that even the non-members were saying, uh, we're going to follow the NFO pattern, we're going to hold. Well, this is fine. This is an important step. But unless they move that volume into the market in a volume sales, bargain for it, Keep it in an even flow so that you do not have the wide fluctuation so you keep moving the general price level up to the desired level. Unless they do that together through a coordinated bargaining and selling program, then they're not going to receive the results that they need to receive um, by just individually trying to do right. anything. They've learned to store and hold. Now they must also learn to bargain together and sell together. That is collective bargaining. And that is the NFO program. The United States Farm Report has presented why the farmers need to support the NFO grain program as a public service in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. Special guests on today's program were Orrin Lee Staley, president of the National Farmers Organization, and Herb Goodman, National Grain Commodity Director. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week for more facts on agriculture, the economic gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth.